maybe it would be out there. I had no chance to go out and scout this location. I was just sent some pictures from the publicist's phone. And um, it made some really nice opportunities for video for uh, fabric moving. Um, so we, we had them go find some rolls of fabric and tried to find some colors that would work with what they were wearing. And you can see that there's um, a Sony video camera, which is just an A7S, that's a stills camera, set up for video. And then my, uh, that's my Nikon D850. I'm always shooting tethered. Um, I'll usually have some grip equipment to try and create some shade so I can see what the camera, uh, you know, what, what the monitor is showing because it's really hard in the bright sun, sunlight to look. Um, and uh, this lighting is not ideal, it's pretty harsh, but with that wind I realized there was no way I was going to bring reflectors out. There was no way I was going to have stands with soft boxes. There was no way I was going to uh, even with portable power, um, it would have been a nightmare out there. So I just gave up on the idea of trying to do anything very technical and uh, kept it very much what I see is what I get. And of course, in stills, you're shooting raw, so you've got enough uh, detail to work with. Um, we asked the farmer not to cut their field, uh, one of their fields, because we wanted this look of this prairie grass. And of course, most of the fields had been cut by um, mid-September but she held off about three weeks um, on this one field so we had this one spot we could go to which was great um, so you know you can go and scout something and then come back three weeks later it looks totally different you have to be aware of um, things are changing on a farm it's not going to be exactly like that every day um, I'm just going to put my headphones on in case you're talking so the um, the requirements for doing stills and video is interesting. And the reason it's interesting is that um, you're looking for motion anytime you do video. Um, and with stills, you're looking for perfect lines. So sometimes things would work really well for stills and they wouldn't work for video or vice versa. Um, the person on the left is, is Tara. She's the... Um, Associate Artistic Director. She was a principal ballerina that I worked with for probably at least a dozen years when she was at the company. And um, she was my person who, I guess, helped organize uh, if, if I needed to give them some correction or if um, I had a, a concern, we would basically talk this through. And we really just worked shot by shot um, I wanted this idea of people running through the, through the, uh, um, the grass. This is actually really quite dangerous. The, the, the ground was not flat. It was full of all types of holes and horrible stuff. And um, you really can't see where your feet are. So I was a little concerned about uh, them getting hurt, but we, we seemed to get through okay. The lighting really did change quite dramatically. I was expecting a lot of really beautiful blue skies with these big open expanses and sometimes it just the overcast wasn't what I was looking for other times so the overcast was really helpful um, so in something like this um, I brought with me uh, a ladder that on the grip truck and we could um, create whatever angle we needed uh, a very low tech just get up on a ladder find another vantage point you can see her foot going into the ground there was a real big issue of trying to do anything turning or moving on the ground uh, the um, head electrician came up with the idea of putting in some plastic like a uh, Tupperware top so that the dancer could spin on on the ground. Um, things I hadn't really thought about because I would ask for her to do some type of turn and of course she wouldn't be able to. Um, one of the other things that we always dealt, I always deal with when I'm dealing with um, uh, commercial work is that uh, sometimes the designer wants to make a vertical out of a horizontal, so I'll always shoot a plate shot. I'll always include more sky or more landscape or something that the, um, the designer can blend together. So if she wants to put text somewhere else, um, I'm always aware of, I'm not making these as eight by tens. I'm making these full frame. I'm doing no cropping on them and the designer can basically um, crop it as needed for, for usage. David, I'm going to jump in now. 
Um, we've got a couple of questions I want you to take. Um, one of them is going to be when you shoot tethered, which program do you use? Uh, Rita was saying that her Nikon the Lightroom tethered the works. Um, I have two programs. Lightroom used to be pretty flaky. I find it pretty good right now. Um, and also making sure, especially outside, that your cable is really secured so you don't uh, trip on it. Uh, but Lightroom is definitely the go-to. Uh, the other camera I'm going to be talking about is the Hasselblad, and the Hasselblad has its own software called um, Focus, and Focus is um, proprietary to Hasselblad, so it would look very similar to Lightroom. Um, it has a little bit more controls for marais, and um, uh, it is not really used as a library program. It's really just more like a capture one. I think most people use Capture One. I just never learned it and uh, uh, never bought it. Um, I think it's probably the best program out there for 35 mil, but it's, I never had an assistant who, who, who knew it. My daughter, who's a photographer, uh, doesn't um, use it. So we've always hoped we'd get someone in the studio who could teach it to us, <laughs> but it's a great program. Okay, then the other question is, uh, what type of uh, fabric did you use for the dancers to hold? And was this an idea that was pre-planned um, by you or the uh, dance company? Um, I think uh, um, Bryce, who's on the left there, is the um, graphic designer and uh, kind of creative director on the shoot. She's a, she, she was... Uh, basically created a look sheet of what she was hoping this this uh, shoot would look like and uh, when I came on the first day there were rolls and rolls of silk like actual silk and many many different colors none of it had been cut up so I think there was some plans to try and do something we because we had done that shoot uh, over 10 years ago with fabric and we knew it would look interesting but I certainly didn't do a lot of talking about it and I went into um, where we were storing all the fabric and basically we just pulled it out and said, oh, I like this color, I like that color, this looks good. And we took it out in the field and figured out, well, how long do we need it? Um, and basically that, that uh, was just made up on the spot. And you remember they have a costume department, so they have a lot of fabric. Um, it's not a big deal to ask them to bring fabric out because uh, they make all their costumes from scratch. Okay, those are the only questions. Okay, so um, this is that day when the light was later in the day. Um, I was really grateful that we were able to do uh, to work then because um, it's one of the few times I actually got uh, a blue sky and just a warm, warm light. Uh, most of the time it was very overcast, which is, you know, nice light, but you just don't get that, that the color you want. And you can see how big this stuff gets used uh, compared to putting things on your website. Um, that's probably 12 feet high. So uh, the file size is actually quite important to me because of the, the type of uses that they use them for. Um, they had come up with this 80th logo idea. Um, so this was definitely a wide, wide, narrow shot that was um, specific for uh, certain uses. Um, and also uh, when you're dealing with a lot of people and you know you feel you're cropping out heads, you know, the front row looks great, but it's hard to get the other people in. I would, um, I'll, I'll show you how alternate uh, shots of this, but that, that narrow shot, which would seem very narrow, you can see how, oh, I died again, interesting see what's going on sorry guys those things happen well it hasn't happened for a week <laughs> of course it happening now <laughs> i've got a couple more questions once you're up um yeah. once you're able to focus again the the first question is is um from technical shoot planned with the art director and then settling down with the situation and giving up on the original creatives how did you handle that and then I'll have another question after that sorry say that again well I, I, I think originally you know you kind of had 
one idea about what you're going to do between you and the, and the art director. And then once you're in the situation, you kind of had to make some adjustments. And I'm, I think the question is really kind of like, how did, how did you work with the art director on that? Did, you know, were you guys constantly like talking about how this was working or, you know? We, we, we had a couple uh, in the schedule. When we go back to the schedule, um, there, there was at the end of the day, um, kind of a recap, like a half an hour given when we were striking all our gear to say, did we get what we wanted? Are we happy with what we're shooting? Uh, and we did that every day. I mean, sometimes we would go out for dinner and chat about things, but uh, it's really the, art, the associate artistic director that was more controlled with what the dancers are doing. Uh, the designer is more concerned about the shape. Uh, do I have enough foreground? Do I have enough background? Um, le she was less, less there for me to help with the creative. I think it was more the styling was, was through her. Um, but it was the associate artistic director that was more helpful in how do we get this to work? How can we reposition people? Um, so there was not, on, on a lot of shoots where I'm working with a, our, with a creative director, there's actually sketches and drawings and very specific planning that I'm almost trying to uh, create a photo that's been thought up. In this instance, nothing's been thought up in the, in the sense that in my eye, I don't see all these pictures. I just put people, position them for the light and try and figure it out, uh, work on the spacing with um, uh, the, the associate artistic director with, with uh, uh, Tara. And, and we really work on it um, in, in a very visceral, live way. And that's really uh, what's great with working with this company. There's so much trust there because I've worked with them for 40 years that um, it doesn't have to all be worked out. Um, did that answer the question? I think so. Yep. Um, the, it was quite cold being so late in the year. Um, and uh, I'm always concerned about uh, the safety of the dancers. Um, so, you know, everyone had blankets, uh, but they were really in good spirits. I think because it was such an unusual experience for them too, not just me. Uh, uh, that's Sophia, she's the principal dancer with the company. And uh, well, you can see her booties on the bottom, right? How she's trying to keep her, her shoes clean as long as she can. Of course, they don't last very long, but um, they die pretty quickly. So that later in that day, we did have, uh, went right through sunset. Uh, a lot of the sunset was more for the, the video work, but um, it's really, really um, so much nicer when you're working with light that, that you can interact with. Uh, this would all just be um, grab shots. I, might, I think I shot the video and I just quickly grabbed them. And then Tara would be giving them um, the timing because we'd be going through, I wouldn't have them pose with their arms, I'd have them going through, she'd be giving counts and they'd be uh, marking the movement so that I could get it real. I don't really like people holding things so she would uh, help time all of this together. And this, these images are shot by Mark. He's the head electrician. Uh, he's the one who does all the touring lighting when, when uh, the company travels. And he, he always has a camera with him when he tours. So I asked him, um, he, you've just been hired to do behind the scenes. So he was very excited to kind of be given a little job to, uh, to run around with his camera. And um, he was also, his department were the grip people, the people who brought equipment out, who set up uh, stands, who brought Apple boxes on set. So the video component, um, the, the stills, stills camera, which is a, a Sony A7S is mounted on a, it's called a Movi, which is a, a gimbal. And it allows you to walk around. Uh, you can get nice low angles because I have a monitor uh, on, on the top of the camera. And that allows me to see what the camera's seeing. So I, I don't have to be on the ground. I can uh, handhold it. Now you, you could do something like this for stills, but I only really use that for video. Um, and with the lighting the way it was, um, I really went more for silhouette look because the lighting was so harsh at times that it was better just to let her go dark. Um, 
the wind was so strong that it was just uh, to bring out a big six by six uh, reflector was would have been so dangerous. So I just gave up on any of the technical things I would have normally done. If this was a theater shot, I probably would have had, you know, more lighting and we worried about lighting her face. But I just um, uh, these shots are all done very quickly. How many assistants did you have there? Just the two uh, electricians, basically. Okay. The, the head of the department, and then um, there were lots of people there watching, but they weren't really working. So I'm used to really working at the ballet when I set up the studio. I usually have a technical director person who's helping me set up backgrounds, and that's the only person I ever have. Um, when I'm working on uh, more traditional commercial shoots, yeah, I always have like a camera assistant. I, um, I think I think in the very beginning you answered this. You, you kind of talked about this, but uh, I've I've already got a couple more questions on this, and that is, you know, how I, I guess basically, how do you build a relationship with the bigger companies? You know, like before you have any relationship. Well, I mean, look what I did. I I went for free to the ballet and spent two weeks sitting in their studio. I mean, how much more to show a commitment of. Um, I'm interested in ballet, and when they looked at the pictures and they realized they were really good and useful, they thought, well, maybe this guy's worth looking into. So I think the, I put a lot of effort and time into starting a relationship with them. Uh, they had nothing to lose having me there for two weeks. And um, if it's a ballet school, I mean, you can show up and say, I wanna come to class every day for a week. and and. It's one way to learn ballet. It's another way to uh, simply give them back some behind the scenes images they probably never bothered to shoot. And uh, if, if, you're, if you're good at it, if you, if you um, can come up with some great shots, uh, they're going to be interested in inviting you back saying, well, we wouldn't mind doing something a little more um, planned and controlled. But a lot of my early stuff is very documentary. It's not with lighting. It's just showing up in the rehearsal space and trying to come away with, uh, I mean, I, I go to a lot of the, uh, Arts Umbrella is a big dance school here. They have um, some of the top choreographers in the world coming, working with them. And all the time I used to call them up and just say, uh, oh, you got um, uh, Crystal Pipe coming in this, this week. It's like top choreographer in the world today. Um, I'd love to spend some time there. Now, they might have some money to be able to pay me to to take some shots, but I usually like the pressure of just coming in and saying, I I just like to hang out. That's my favorite thing to do. And I think uh, that's something I've done with um, uh, small dance companies, contemporary companies, just come and I'll, I just want to come to your uh, rehearsals today, see what you're doing. Um, so. When I started out, there were not a lot of dance photographers. It was a pretty small area. And I think that's one of the reasons why the, the government gave me a grant because they realized there was a shortage of people. So wasn't as much competition when I started. Um, I don't really, um, I think some artistic directors have their favorite photographers. And when you're at a high level dance company like the National Ballet in Canada or Le Grand Ballet Canadien, they're, they're gonna use people with a lot of experience, like Rachel, right? Rachel's gonna be brought into big, big companies. So you start small, you start with a small ballet school, you start with a small uh, local things and your reputation uh, spreads very quickly because in the dance world, if you're good at shooting dance, the community finds out very quickly, you know. Um, so uh, offer yourself, and it's also a way to learn, because if you don't know a lot about the technical side of ballet, the only way you're going to do it is to be in class every day and actually watch correction and watch all that stuff. Uh, outside of that, I'm not really a marketer. I'm not an expert at, um, did I do any great marketing to get myself out there? No, I just shot an awful lot of theater and ballet until I had a reputation, then people would start inviting me to um, come to Montreal to shoot Le Grand Ballet Canadian or come to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival to shoot them. It took years and years before I really had that kind of reputation. And, and did you uh, have a background in dance yourself? No, I'm saying none. So how, how long did it take to understand, like, like uh, especially if, if a dancer is doing a leap or a, or a turn, how, how long did it take for you to understand when to take the shot? 
Um, I think because a lot of my work is very documentary uh, in the sense that I shoot a lot of live stage shows, a lot of live performance work. It's inherent in just when you do it. You just, you just know. Uh, you, um, first of all, I shot on film. You couldn't look at the back of the camera and I'm used to the idea of knowing I got the shot even if I can't see it. And that's one of the things of um, using the Hasselblad. You only get 12 shots on the Hasselblad when you were shooting film. So you only took a picture if you knew you were gonna get something. You didn't just blindly shoot. 35 mil, um, you got 36 shots. You got a little bit more to work with, but basically uh, those early days were trial and error. That's how I learned. I just spent a lot of time uh, shooting rehearsals, shooting dress rehearsals. And uh, um, if you miss the shot, it doesn't come back. But in the studio, I had more control. So in some ways, um, there's no excuse in the studio to miss a shot, but in um, on performance day, um, there were lots of shots you miss, lots of shots where your timing's not right because um, things are changing so quickly. So it's important to do both. It's important to do studio, it's important to do live, to shoot the dress rehearsal. And you can invite yourself, you can, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, people are doing, uh, uh, dress rehearsals. You invite yourself in um, to shoot some stuff, even if you're not getting paid for it, as long as you're not competing with another, you know, paid photographer there. Um, and a lot of times they do recitals just in a little rehearsal hall in there. Uh, doesn't make a difference where you're shooting, as long as you get the practice. And it takes a lot of practice, I think, to shoot um, without without really having. Um, I mean, it's the spontaneity of dance that I love, not the, in theater, I have a lot more anticipation and control of what I do, but in dance, I love the fleeting nature of it. So I think spending a lot of time in rehearsal is where you learn the line and the technique because it's all about what they do in ballet class. Um, they're always correcting the dancers. So it's a really valuable thing to spend time in, even if it's a young group of people because it's the same, same things are, taught to, to any level. So let me see if this still works. Uh oh, getting that bad thing. That's bad. I guess I should have rebooted my computer before I started all this. <laughs> or I can't stop for some reason. If you're able to do that while you're thinking and talking, another question that came up was, do you still mainly shoot film in the studio or have you gone fully digital, I think? I went, I went fully digital in 2001. Um, there was a, a bit of a transition. One of the transitions was, um, uh, one of the transitions was basically the Hasselblad, it's Imacon, a company that made uh, digital backs, came out with a back that would fit the Hasselblad. So not Hasselblad, but uh, another company, a third party. And so I transitioned probably before then with uh, an actual digital back, um, probably, oh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact date, but probably for about three or four years, when the first digital cameras came out, they were pretty crappy and they couldn't compete with scanning two and a quarter film. So what I did is, um, you could you could scan two and a quarter film, and that was a transition time where you could you know make nice images. But when the digital back came out, it was a bit of an investment, but it allowed me to continue using the Hasselblad. And the Hasselblad was a completely manual camera, so where the film back would go, you would just basically put uh, this back on. And I think that was a great transition for me because it meant I could keep the quality of what film looked like, but I had. Um, I think it was a 16 megapixel at the time, which would have been huge compared to what was out in regular cameras. Um, and really the, the, the main thing was um, the investment if continuing to use your same lenses, your same camera body, and just putting a back on seemed to make sense at the time because there wasn't any high, high-end integrated cameras like the actual, um, uh, like 
Well, I have one here. I can show you later what a house fly looks like. But most of the time, it was really a hybrid of, a, of an older style camera with uh, a digital back. And I, I've seen Lois Greenfield uh, use, use that in the old days. She probably has something newer now. But I think there was something very, um, one of the more important things about the shutter in a camera is that, that sensitivity to the shutter. And the house flood was always very good. Um, I love the, the connection to the camera with my finger compared to an electronic shutter. Um, so the Hasselblad to me has always been part of the history of uh, shooting with high quality images where you've got lots of detail and the digital back adding to it added a lot of um, uh, keeping the quality of the work up but not having to, um, there, there was nothing at the time available that was completely integrated digital. So we're gonna move inside now. We had a place where we had rain cover. So we have a barn. Now the barn was being used for lessons. So we had certain times of the day we could use it. Um, the dancers on the first day didn't arrive till around one o'clock. So Tara and I, oh, she's still having problems. Don't know what that's all about. You can always switch computers if this keeps happening. It's never happened with my laptop. Sorry guys. <clears throat> Try one more time. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, I suggested to Tara that we do a class um, at the, pretend this is the bar, and she liked that idea. So we, we mocked up what we would do. And when they arrived, this would be on the first day, we, we did basically um, what, what the look of a company class was like at the bar. And um, you can even see in the barn, the wind blowing through um, how, how strong the wind was. This was um, kind of a diffused plastic that you know, is used to keep the sun down and it works perfectly as a big softbox. So um, available light's beautiful. If you have good light, why light it? Um, I'd have a couple cameras set up, always a video camera and a still camera in case I had to go back and forth between the two. Um, and then uh, again, using the Mobi, the, the gimbal to, to get some movement for the video work. And she would be talking through the movements so that they were not posed there. They were actually going through the exercise she was giving them. And she, she would, at that time, she was teaching class. So she was basically just giving them uh, things they would do normally in a class. Um, that's the Hasselblad there. Um, this, the, the one time I used lights was really for uh, stills. Uh, we never really used any light for video. Um, and you can see how the flag is set up to try and cover the computer so we can see clearly because it's so bright. Um, and we had power, so power wasn't an issue, which is great. There was always uh, some place we could run power from. Oh, I'm getting the uh, that circle again. I don't know what to do about this. Um, I don't know if I should restart or just try and do it on my laptop. I'm not sure. Um, um, but, but I kind of feel like it's going to just keep happening. Um, well, what, what if I log on with my laptop? Would that be because I know my laptop's here. Works fine. Okay. Do, do you have the uh, uh, the link on your laptop that you'd be able to? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I do. Okay. I do. So let me just try and. Okay. So I could close this. Everyone could take a break. I could I could play this movie now while I'm doing this. Oh, could I play yeah, it? that would be terrific. Yeah. So do you, you see that? Can I just play this? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you get the sound, but I'll I'll just go ahead. This is the movie from what we shot, and in the meantime, I'll get my laptop going. David, can you hear me? Yeah. It's stuttering a little bit and uh, there, there is no sound. 
um, I sent you a link. If you go back to being in the chat and you can get them just to uh, look at it there. And it's a link to Vimeo. Did you see that link? Yeah, I've got it. I'm doing it right now. Can you somehow share yep. that yeah, with them? Right now, yep. Put it in the... Here's the link, everyone. It, it probably play back a lot better on that way. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can play it here for everyone. Okay. So I'm going to take over. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sign off for a second and re-sign on. Do yep. I have a trouble getting signed back on? Uh, you shouldn't, as long as you have that link. Okay. Yep. Bye. Bye. Okay. So now I'm going to share this and I'm going to come over here. Oh, what is this doing? Oh, it's asking me which one I want to share. I think it's this one. There you go. Okay. And now I'm going to play it. So hopefully everybody can see that. Might be better to actually have them play it themselves. Oh, this is working really well, I think. I, I can't tell what they're seeing. Okay. The sound's not very good. But if you send them the link on the chat that I sent you privately. I did. Everybody can hear you right now. Okay. They can play it themselves. I can't get the video to work. I think we have to do that whole host thing once you're done. So I have to get the host back yes, on again. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. There we go. So uh, start video again. Will that work, or do we have to? Oh no, there we go. Yeah, like that's working. Yeah. There we go. Oops. And I have some type of weird background. Now I don't. I don't see you up here, so I can make you the spotlight. Is the problem? You're not up on top like you normally are. Hmm. Oh. oh. Am I a participant now? Yeah, make, make me back to the host. Maybe that's what I need to see. Switch me to okay. the host. So I've got to click on your name. Yep. Make host. There we go. But I'm still not seeing you. That's weird. And there we go. Perfect. Okay. So I can share again? Yes. Okay, we'll try this. Just trying to go over to my um, laptop because I've had no troubles with it. So let's go back to where we left off. We were <clears throat> dealing with um, uh, you can see I'm tethered there. Basically, um, what we what we were 
working with there was the Hasselblad. The Hasselblad, um, this is a more integrated Hasselblad where the back is part of the camera. It's not a, an older 500 cm body with um, a pack. This is an actual um, full HD 100. That's 100 megapixels. So really large files. Um, one of the advantages of it is that um, the shutters are in the lenses, so you can sync at very high shutters. You don't need to, to be limited to your 1 25th sync when you're shooting with um, strobe. So um, leaf shutters are really a nice feature when you're working with. Uh, it, the format is a little bit closer to a magazine cover, 645. It's not as long and narrow. And I don't know if you've ever found with 35 mil, sometimes it's really hard to get in a jump not crop on a vertical their hands or their feet going out to the edge of frame so it's a much it's a little closer to a square okay so this gives you an idea of um the video at the bottom uh, uh 1920 by 1080 is standard video um that's what most uh phones and video cameras shoot uh 4k video is 3800 pixels that's what i shot the video for the ballet and um, the Nikon is, uh, the D850 is a 70 to 100 pixel. Now it's a big file, right, compared to most 35mm cameras. And the Hasselblad, you can see, is 11,600. So we're talking about gigantic files, like 300 megs uh, in 8-bit. In so that's a standard, you know, TIFF file. Um, the... Um, I think in the, the week we shot 2.4 terabytes of data when I include all the video stuff. So it's big. <clears throat> so Ron, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, and also what, what this allows, this really big format, is that a lot of times what designers are wanting is not the image that you're seeing. It's all the stuff around to drop type into. So they might want more foreground than you would normally want to frame. They might want more height than you normally frame or width. And that's really important in working with um, a graphic designer or art director is their needs are different than your needs. If I was just shooting this for the dancer, it'd be very different for a solo shot than it would be for a brochure. So that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, large overframed images are important in commercial work. Um, to deal with some of the lighting, uh, I mean, we obviously had beautiful light coming in through windows. This is completely overcast. There is no sun out there. And uh, the, the only thing that I brought um, to, to deal with lighting was sometimes a reflector. And uh, inside it was, it was about a six foot by six foot reflector. And it, it's pretty um, easy to handle inside. Outside it was uh, a nightmare, so I just gave up on using any type of reflected light. But um, it would give me very nice, beautiful, soft fill um, if I didn't want the harsh shadows. And sometimes the shadows are really nice. It's not, sometimes, sometimes these reflectors are too powerful and you have to back them off. On the back side would be white, it would be softer. And then you also have a black, and the black is used for subtractive lighting. And then you also have a silk, and the silk would be used for cutting sunlight. So um, these, these six by six frames um, could be put on stands, and they're, uh, they're fantastic for putting light through or bouncing light through. Um, and they're very dangerous outside if you don't have all types of people sandbagging them down. Um, it can get really badly hurt because sometimes we use 12 by 12s and that's a really big surface. So that's what that looks like uh, with that silver uh, fill coming in. So this would, these would be just some quick shots that we just did some portraits while we were hanging about. And one of the dancers had her new baby, so I just grabbed her and said, let's take a quick shot of your baby. Um, there was a big opening in the barn and uh, so even with the sunlight, there's this kind of very murky, murky sky. It was really hard to get the kind of rich colors I was wanting. Um, but um, the Hasselblad's pretty good about dealing with um, true 16-bit uh, compared to 14-bit on a Nikon. So it does have a little more data in the shadows and the highlights. Um, but a lot of times it was so bright out there, I just had to go more for silhouette. 
Um, and uh, again, uh, then a, a little quick video clip at the end. Um, this kind of lighting, it's really nice to have tethering because it's so hard to figure out what your exposure is going to be. Um, you're trying to get a little bit of sky, but you're, you, know, you don't want to blow out the highlights and you, know, you don't want to underexpose. So, um, and then once in a while, I would just see a little opportunity and grab, grab Sophia or someone and say, oh, do something there. I don't care what it is. And they would just pose and I'd move everyone out of the way and just take a shot. We tried to introduce them to the animals one day and um, we were hoping to do some dancing with the animals, just the llamas hanging out. Uh, was really not very successful, but they had a good time just hanging out with them, getting to know them. Um, we wanted to do something with the goats, so we, we had the farmer build a little uh, hay bale that they could sit on and we could do some uh, nice uh, group shots. Then uh, we have stuff that we, that we call, um, remember, because we don't have a repertory of what, what we're going to be shooting or for the next season. So we, we do what we call athletic shots, which are just whatever, dancers just bring ideas and they, they have maybe five minutes. We have five minutes, show me what you want to do and we uh, go ahead and shoot. When the sun was out, I could just go to a 800th of a second on the camera with the Hasselblad and, uh, get a, enough of a um, sharpness um, to freeze the motion. Um, there were times when the sun went away and I, I just could not get, I mean, I'm probably at 400 ISO here trying to keep the quality uh, as good as I can. Um, so this would have been like maybe a couple hours of just grabbing different people and just trying to get some nice shots of them. And, uh, you know, the light's coming from camera left and you're hoping everyone's gonna kind of relate to camera left, but not everyone likes uh, facing the, the place where the light is. So sometimes you have to figure out um, in an overcast day where there's not a lot of light coming in and someone wants to face the other way, you're gonna have to put a light in there. So the only light I brought with me was a, a little small dime light pack. Um, you can see two cables coming out of it. It's because it's a bi-tube head um, I don't know if you've ever seen a bi-tube head. It's basically two flashes inside one flash, and it allows you to basically keep the power down, because the more power you put through a strobe, the, 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 the you lose sharpness because of the flash duration. So um, when I can, I try and use a bi-tube head, um, keep the power down so that I get um, approximately a three thousandth of a second would be my uh, goal. I have an actual meter that tells me the flash duration. And the 3,000th is a, a really nice, uh, you're gonna get really nice sharp pictures. Now with this, you're also dealing with flash and ambient light. So the high shutter of my, my Hasselblad is great because it will actually, I can control how much ambient light comes into the picture because I can sync my strobe up to an 800th of a second on my camera. Can't do that with the Nikon unless you're using um, special flashes that will sync. But you can see there's two plugs going into the pack. And um, this light, rim light is, it's not a great, well-made, um, it's fairly inexpensive, parabolic. But what it does is it gives you that really focused light um, that you can punch the light into a specific spot, almost like a spotlight. And you can take the diffusion off. So, um, you can see that he's lit there with that light coming through. It's probably with the diffuser on, but the diffuser off would give you even a harder look. Um, and the uh, shutter speed on the camera was probably about an 800th, and it was probably at like f6.3, something like that. Again, that's the strobe going off, because it was getting kind of murky and she wanted to face away from the, the, uh, the nice light that was coming through, so the strobe helped. Uh, one time when you don't need the strobe is really when you get someone really close to, to um, natural light, to the window, you have beautiful light, so there's no reason to use fill or um, just grab her and say, try working right there, let's see what it looks like, and um, 
so that kind of light is really beautiful. So we cycled through probably a lot of the soloists um, in that afternoon, um, getting as much as we could. We eventually got them to close the door at the back. Um, and um, even there, you can see a bit of movement from the shutter of the camera being an 800th. His feet are still moving. Um, so we're not working totally in strobe here. We're dealing with strobe plus uh, the shutter being at 800th. We're not getting total sharpness. If we were in the studio, that would be tack sharp. Okay, I got a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Um, one, when you were originally shooting uh, the video, um, uh, were, were you shooting it like with the idea that you knew exactly how it was going to fit in from one scene to the next? Because you had some some really cool scenes where they were making a movement and then they were still making that same movement in a completely different scene and it worked really well together. Um, that stuff that I just made up on the spot. I oh, just, cool. I just had those two people for, for a couple hours and, um, uh, in, in uh, video you're looking for transitions and things that connect and, um, so those are just things that you're very aware of. It, it, you, you put on two very different brains when you're, when you're doing video and you're doing stills. Not only are you dealing with different lighting, you're dealing with um, this idea of how does one shot connect to the next shot. And in stills, we never think of that. We don't really have that kind of storytelling where this picture has to, you know, unless you used to do magazine uh, um, type of work where there was 10 pictures. Most of the time you're showing one picture. So in, in video, you're a little bit more aware of the fact that something has to lead into another. And when you can, the more you can connect those things, the better. One of the nice things about using a gimbal is a lot of times um, you're trying to do long takes without any editing. You're trying to, to start uh, a shot uh, and end a shot in one long continuous take over maybe a minute. And usually, you know, in video, you're dealing with very short little clips that are put together. Um, but what happens in the editing process is you start discovering things too. You start seeing, oh, someone's arm does this, and then they do it another shot. Uh, that might be interesting to connect those. So a lot of the editing is discovery because um, the only goal you have is to make something two and a half minutes long, find some music, and w weave it all together, but make sure that there is. Um, a sense of, uh, well, I mean, that things make sense. And, and in some instances, because we had to put the titles of the shows in that we're gonna be, and once we eventually knew in, in February what the shows were, we had to put titles in and we tried to connect, oh, well, this section maybe would be good for, you know, outside for the Bayadere, or this section would be good for um, the retrospective piece. So, um, it was pretty much left up to me how to edit it. I would show them rough cuts and they would give me some ideas of, we don't really like the, uh, what she looks like in this shot. Could you find an alternative one? Right. Uh, but really a lot of it was just made up as we went. Okay, I've got a, a whole bunch of series of questions for you. One, one mm -hmm. did, did you guys have to rent this barn, this farm? I think it was donated. I think she was just a fan of the ballet and she was thrilled to have us there. Cool. Are you so I, 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 don't, I don't really know the exact details, but I, I know that she was just like over the moon having us there every day. <laughs> are, are you editing your own videos? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Dynalite is no longer in business, so are you transitioning to another brand? Uh, it's tricky. Uh, it's a big investment at my age to start buying new lighting. I do have a daughter who I share a studio with, and we, we have been talking about looking at um, the mono lights that uh, Rachel was using at the, um, the conference. It's a pretty big investment. So I have enough packs that we could probably just wait for them to start breaking yep. and see, see how it goes. But Dynalite would not be the first choice if you were starting out now anyways. Um, it, it, it's because a lot of the stuff I do is on the road and a lot of portraiture and things that it was just great to have a small kit and anything that our studio lights are big, bulky, heavy, cost a fortune to ship. So um, Dynalite was a great 
um, starting point of how to get someplace without bringing a ton of gear. And you can, I think when I went to Stratford last year, I shipped out seven cases of equipment. Um, huh. So even with Dynalites, there's a lot of stuff. Um, so I think part of it would be looking at what, what are good for short flash duration strobes out there if I was going to replace them. And 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of choices. There's a lot more choices now. Yep. What uh, frame rate were you capturing video at? Um, I was shooting 4K, um, 24 frames a second. Okay. And if they, if they, uh, if you go to my Vimeo page, you probably can see that a little better because I it was not streaming that well on my end when I was watching. Uh, so probably worth watching it again just to to see a bit better for the sound. Okay, one more question just popped up. Um, you know, over the years, as your relationship with the uh, Royal Winnipeg Ballet has grown, is it typical that their budget with you will grow because they understand the skill set you're bringing to it? This was the first year after after this one we did one uh, uh, another shoot inside, and it was the Tara, who's the associate artistic director, is getting more involved in the business side of things now as a, as a possible, um, I guess, dealing with budgets. And she called me up quite embarrassed and said, we'd like to have you back, but I have a specific budget in mind and I'm embarrassed to ask you. So there are times when, listen, they've, made, they've, they've, they've had a good season, they've got a surplus, they can afford to pay me what I want. And there are other times when, you know, can you, can you come and work at this rate? And I'll, and I'll say, sure. Yeah, I don't care. I mean, if, as long as I'm having a good time, I don't really care. It's, it, I mean, I make money on the post-production prepping files. I make money on the editing. So it, it's not going to change what I do because they have $400 a day less or something like that. Um, but really, the, uh, the, the main thing is I... I really plan my budget based on who the company is. If it's a small little company with six dancers, I'm gonna be charging very differently than when I'm dealing with a bigger company. So when I'm at Stratford working with, you know, it's a $75 million budget at Stratford to run the company, I can charge what I want because they have the money to do that. When I'm with a smaller company, I have a smaller budget. So money has never been the driving force of, I won't work with you unless you pay me this much. It's, it's um, if it's something I want to do, I'll do it. And if they can afford to pay me, then I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a certain amount of money and, and see what they say. But um, the, uh, the, the main thing is that there is a bit of money being made on the post-production. So you know, if you're going to get a, an order of 100 images to prep, there's going to be a nice chunk of money coming after the shoot. So keep going? Yep, keep going. I have, I have more questions in a few minutes, but let's keep yeah. going. So, so anyways, the uh, thing about the barn is that um, if you've ever worked inside the, the door of a barn, there's beautiful light in there. Um, oh, oh, something's not working again. Oh, geez. I wonder if this has to do with Zoom because it's never, it's never happened before. It, it, it's possible. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've been doing it all week. It's weird. Sorry, try that again. While you're doing that, um, um, one person asked, like, do you walk into a shoot like this with a complete shot list or, and I know we talked about this early on, uh, but, and then, or do a lot of shots get added as you go about your day, or you pri prioritize certain things. And then if you have time, you capture more images. And I, I, I think your answer to a lot of that is gonna be yeah to a lot of it, but go ahead. I think when we're dealing with these kind of shots, there's a very specific shot list of what we're doing and what it's going to be used for. When we're doing stuff that's more generic on this shoot that we're, we're talking about, it's uh, a lot of it is made up on the spot. Um, you know, because they're, really they're seeing it on the screen. They know, they know what they're getting, yeah, right? But you get, nobody really knows until they get there oftentimes. And, and especially within, and then there's the light that plays into it, so. Well, and if I see the light being really nice in the morning, I say, you know, it's going to be a nice day. Could we move things outside earlier? Could, you know, you have to look at the each day separately to say, 
um, I'd rather be inside the barn today or I'd rather be outside. Um, so part of that is the discussion looking at the weather every day because you're terrified it's going to start pissing rain and then, then what do we do? Um, so part of it is, is definitely um, on location, you have to play with how's the weather, what can we do, what we can't do. We can't get them wet. Um, and I'm used to just working very quickly. You know, uh, I don't have like six assistants. We're not setting up big bits of equipment. Um, so there was a, a hayloft and I just thought, well, let's go up in the hayloft. Let's see what it looks like. And um, this is on the second floor of the barn where they were standing outside earlier. And, you know, the light was nice, but I didn't really think it was a great spot. So we spent maybe 20 minutes there. Um, it was so bright, I had to bring in a flag just to, to uh, flag the camera from the flare. And, you know, basically said, you know, I'm done. Let's move. I don't think we need any more of this. So there are times when things would work. Sometimes things, you know, weren't, weren't as interesting and you would just move on. Um, rarely do I hand hold the Hasselblad. It's really heavy and um, the depth of field, you know, even at 7.3, I think that's like F7.3. Uh, it's very shallow. You can, I don't even think her back shoulder's in focus. So if you're not shooting at F16, there's no way you would get everyone in focus. So Hasselblad has very shallow depth of field. So usually I'll use, you don't get the kind of continuous focus you would get on a 35 mil. Um, it's much more kind of locking focus. Um, you can see how the problems of uh, seeing feet in a field. And um, uh, so there were certain things that, you know, I wanted to do some close-ups and realize this is not going to work. But uh, one of the tricks we always use when we're shooting feet is to have someone holding them outside the shot. So, because um, there's no point in them trying to hold their balance. We do that in the studio a lot anytime you do close-ups of feet. Those are gorgeous. So these are just, you know, we're standing around, we're just grabbing shots of people, you know, while we were waiting to do this. Uh, lifts are always an issue in ballet because the women look great and the men look like hell because you can't get their faces in or their faces are in their bum or their faces in the crotch. So a lot of times lifts are sound great, but then you do it and it's like, eh, I don't know if we could use this. Oops. Do you uh, show them the images? Like you put an online gallery for them to see and then they pick them out and then how do you get them the images? Do you send them by WeTransfer? The way it works, the way it works with a, um, uh, a ballet company is that it's, they have complete approval over the photographs. So we don't choose anything. Everything has to go through their approval. They have to sign right. off on them. Right. And that's just because they're an equity company. So you can't, um, you can't say, oh, that's my favorite shot. And then they go, well, you know, I don't like my back foot there or something. You have to, you have to let them. So anything I'm showing you that was chosen here is stuff that I, I didn't choose. I would have had other shots I might've shown you. So I'm showing you what was approved. Um, they don't want anything to see the light of day if they haven't had it approved. Right. But do, do you show it to them in an online gallery and then get it? Um, they do it through their publicist. I, I make an online gallery for them and then they do it with their publicist using Pixie Set. And then, and then do you, when you're finished, do you get them the images through Pixie Set as well or where they can? No, just no, no, no. These are, these are 300 megabyte files. They're, oh. they're, they're all sent by, um, you know, we transfer or something like that. Yeah, oh. They're all, they're always done as TIFFs. They're never as JPEGs. Oh, okay. Yeah because you want the best quality, you don't want anything compressed. Yeah. They can make them into JPEGs for press, send them to the newspapers and right. stuff. Right. Um, so, you know, we went around the barn looking for different places to shoot. Um, that last location was less successful. Also, um, bringing with you, um, because it's gonna get uh, muddy and uh, gross, always having something to sit on or uh, trying to keep your, your equipment clean. Um, getting low with the video camera, just sitting the camera on some Apple boxes because the my tripod doesn't go that low. And um, that's an Atomos recorder, which is basically a monitor recorder. So the, the image is actually being recorded to the uh, recorder, not to the actual camera. And it's a much better way for checking focus because it's that was a seven inch screen compared to the little screen at the back. And uh, Wanted to do some things with horse one day because we saw horses. So we just, whenever they were out there, we 
try to to get out and try and do some work with them. They seem to like my two and a quarter bag a lot. I don't know what was in it, but considering it's fifty thousand dollar camera system, you don't really want. So one of one of the like one of the uh, assistant electricians was like there to protect the cameras from the horses throughout the day. And just to finish up, um, that's that, that turning section that was in in the video. And you can see how much easier it is to see on a monitor. You, their monitors allow you to also check focus, exposure, um, what highlights are being blown out. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that the camera doesn't actually have. That uh, The lens I'm using on that is a, a zoom lens. It's Sony's um, 28 to 135. It's a very slow lens, it's an F4, but it's really made for video work. Um, it doesn't work as well because it doesn't have that quick autofocus we're used to, but it certainly works fine for video. And when I'm filming, a lot of times I'm walking backwards. Um, if you've seen anyone using steady cams, there's a lot of work where you're following actors backwards. You always have someone guiding you because it's very easy when you're walking very quickly to bang into something. I don't know what's behind me, so there's always a grip person, in this case, the artistic director's assistant, helping me. Uh, go backwards, because um, if I make any quick movements and I hit a dancer, it would be really disastrous, plus the gear would get trashed. So that's pretty typical when you're filming, you always have someone uh, helping you out. And that's really um, all I had to show you from... We have one more question, David. Um, yeah. You mentioned that on a shoot like this, you make money on editing, is that correct? Well, I get a fee for the editing. Because I mean, shooting the video is just, you just have raw footage, but someone has to put it together. So I'm hired as an editor to put it together. And, and what, what about rough the cuts. photography? Is that, that, that's different. Separate right? fee, separate fee. But the, the yeah. photography is, you, you, they just said, here's what the budget is, and that's what it is, correct? They said, here's, the, for this one, I gave them a budget for a day rate, and then anything past that, um, there was a couple of pieces of equipment I rented. I gave them a rental bill. I rented some gear in town that they paid directly to. I didn't mark it up. And then uh, it was maybe a thousand dollars worth of rental gear. And then uh, uh, outside of that, when I got back to Vancouver, I spent weeks going through the footage. Um, then eventually I would start getting approvals from uh, the publicist saying, oh, this, these photos have been approved. Can we get those in high res? And I would just build them per, per image as it goes, um, doing basic, basic, simple retouching. Okay. And that's, that's kind of it. The only thing I would say about lighting was, um, the only thing that was important to me was to have a stand that would go really high so I could get the light steep. And that was one of the big things on the rental list was to make sure I had a really strong stand that could go 16 feet so that if I wanted the light to get steeper because I wasn't going to be able to hang any lights um, and ordering a lot of sandbags and making sure things were really safe when we were using a light. But outside of that, it's really an available light shoot, most of this. Okay. Well, thank you very much for doing this. I'm going to switch this over now. And... Um, uh, really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. That was some, uh, of course, we got to finish with another crash for Adobe Bridge. <laughs> um, uh, but this was pretty amazing, David. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for, for uh, sharing all the information here. Sure. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching this. And uh, uh, we will catch you on the next webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ron. Appreciate it. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.